in the book of Exodus, God gives a description of how to build the tabernacle. And inside that holy place, there's three main things. There's the altar of showbread. There's the incense table, the altar. These three things, these, the incense, the, the, the showbread, the, uh, the candle, the menorah. This is all a representation, but the main thing I want to focus in right here is going into the chorus is the, the altar of incense. Is the last thing, if you walked into the room, it's the last thing you see is right next to the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the curtain, the, the, the banner that separates the holy place and the most holy place. And this altar, it says, is the most holy of altars because this incense would be an illustration of our prayers going up to God. You hear that in the Psalms where David says that his prayers are the essence, the, the smoke that goes up. So when we sing this, I want you to picture as you worship, as you lift your hands, as you close your eyes, however you feel that you need to worship, I want you to picture your worship like that smoke, the altar of essence. And every single day, twice a day, that high priest, Aaron, at the first time, Aaron would come in every morning and every evening and make sure that incense was going. And that's our incense now as we worship. Can we, we worship together? Day and night, night and day, let incense rise. Day and night, night and day, let incense rise. Day and night, night and day, let incense rise. God, are you ready to receive the word of God today? We are moving through being propelled, pushed, as it were, by the Holy Spirit. I've told this story uh, coming to this church. Um, it happened so quickly. We were living in uh, the, the winter freeze of Pennsylvania, Scranton, Pennsylvania. And you can certainly feel a call to Florida when it's ranging at about 75, 80 degrees. And God says, I'm calling you to southwest Florida, and you say, oh, yes, you are, Lord. <laughs> Holy is the Lord Almighty. I know that this is true. And, uh, but I, I had some dialogue going prior to that, and uh, from November to February, we were having dialogue with the presbyter, uh, and we were talking about this church was open, did not have a pastor, and needed leadership, and uh, we were talking about it as a family, and we went through this process. And as soon as... I don't know if you've experienced this. As soon as you say yes, it's like the Lord just, he just kicks you through all of these doors and they all start opening on no, no uh, pushing of your own. It's just they open, 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 open. And that's what happens. And we feel, and my wife and I feel it's like that's a spiritual gift. It's a spiritual thing that happens to you 
the propelled movement of God, where you cannot possibly do anything. You cannot move the doors. You cannot open opportunities. He's opening them for you, one after another. And we call that the propelled motion of Almighty God. And we've been studying that word all year long at this church, being propelled, being moved from one place to another, to another, and to another, and being able to look back over your shoulder and say these great words, look what the Lord has done. And so we are celebrating that reality that you might feel pushed by the Holy Spirit. And one of them is this act of humility of needing rescue. How many of you have needed rescued and you were doing it by yourself? Anybody? You're trying and you were trying and you needed rescue. How many of you have been in that place with maybe a flat tire on the side of the road? People blowing by you 60, 70 miles an hour and you're just standing there like, hello, I am in need of rescue. And it seems like nobody cares until that good Samaritan finally stops and someone helps you. Uh, we stand in need of rescue. There are moments in our lives that we cannot do alone. And God, I believe, ordains those moments to tell you, you cannot do this. You are in need of rescue. And I am a God that loves to rescue you. I am here and I will use people around you that you might not like or even recognize that they're there to help you, i.e. people that discipline you, put rules in your life, make sure that you're doing the right thing at the right time. All of these things are put in your life. And you're like, God, that isn't what I meant. And he's like, yeah, but it's what you need. You need rescue. You need discipline. You need all of these things to happen in your life. And so uh, David clearly says in times of his life he needed rescue. And one of them is our memory verse for the month. It's Psalm 69, 14. It says, deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me out of the deep waters. I mean, this is the poet, shepherd, king. And he says, God, deliver me. God, I need help. I mean, can't we put ourselves in that category with him? God, I need your help. God, I need delivered. God, I'm up to my neck. I told you about my mother raising two boys. She'd said that to all of us all the time. You boys, I've had it up to here with you. Up to our neck. I'm swimming in it with you guys. And I think David is expressing the same. He's not in floodwaters. He's in up to his neck with people, with decisions, with things that are just too much for him. God, deliver me so I don't sink. I'm going down for the last time. I think it's going up over my head. God, I need you. God, I need your help. And so we need to put that in our, our box of memory verses to say there are times in our lives where, where, where situations are just going to be too much and I'm going to have to yell out, God, deliver me in my time of need. Now, uh, propelled, we've used this imagery all year long, is this wonderful kayak down here. Uh, my wife and I enjoy this sport. We enjoy getting out on the water. But there are times when um, kayaking stops. There are certain things that can happen out on the water that make it not so fun. And it's called getting stuck. There are numerous things in the Florida water that can get you stuck. Um, one of them is fear. Uh, Michael, you know of the American alligator, right? And you say, I'm not going out there. <laughs> I mean, I'll follow you guys anywhere but into the water. Because the, the, the Florida alligator is this one that gets you stuck in this reality that I don't want to be out there with that. <laughs> Another one is thick branches under the water that seem to have fingers of their own. That seem to creep up around the edge of it. And you're just kayaking along thinking you're having a wonderful experience. And then all of a sudden... You're stuck. You're stuck in a level of water. Maybe it's up over top of where you can stand. And you think to yourself, how am I going to get out of this? It's too much. I can't handle this. And then the other uh, problem of getting stuck is when the water drops. And sand is the next thing that, that you feel your kayak on. And you're just kind of stuck. You can't go anywhere. The water is not enough to keep you moving. And now you're stuck and you can be miles from home. You can be miles out in the middle of nowhere 
and realize I'm stuck. There is no way to get out of this set of circumstances. I'm out in what would normally be deep waters, but now it's shallow and I don't know what to do. My kayak cannot move, nor can I move from these set of circumstances, and now I'm stuck. So um, when those situations arise, you know, you can just sit there. You know, do you know anybody like that? They're in trouble, and they just sit there. And I've got to tell people, if that's your attitude towards getting stuck, you're going to stay stuck. Absolutely nothing is going to change in your life if you don't do anything about being stuck. And there are, there are a multitude of things that people try when they're stuck, but we're going to get into that today, that um, this universal reality that if you simply stay where you are and do nothing, uh, it will be an absolute misery. And spiritually speaking, I think a lot of people are there. They don't know what to do. They're stuck in their situation. They do not know how to move out of their situation so they remain simply stuck. And so what we're here to talk about today is that removal from being stuck. God, how do I change my circumstances? What does that move look like? What is my next move in reality of being spiritually stuck in a situation, a lot in life, that I might even be responsible for? There are things that we do in life that get us stuck and then we look around and nobody wants to help us because there are people telling us, well, I told you if you did that, you'd get stuck. What do you think? And you're like, well, yeah, I know. I know that now. Is anyone going to help me? And a lot of times people are like, no, I'm done with you. I'm done. You don't know how to listen. You don't know how to respond. So you're just going to have to suffer where you are. And a lot of people are in that place spiritually Physically, emotionally, they can't move forward. I run into a lot of people at the Lee County Jail. They've got it stacked against them in a lot of ways. They've been arrested. They've got charges. They don't have a, a driver's license. They can't get a job. And they're going to get out of jail next week. And they're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? It's all mounted up against me. I don't know what I'm going to do, chap. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm like, yeah, you're stuck. You are indeed stuck. I will call upon the Lord. I mean, there's got to be a point of humility where we drop to our knees and say, no human can help me. I mean, the answer may come through them by God's will, but God, I need you. I need you to help me. I'm sinking. I'm deep in the mire. I'm in up to my neck. Help me so that I don't drown in my situation. And so um, there's another problem that I want to introduce to you because being stuck can create one more thing called fear. Because now you're in the problem, you know how stuck you are, and fear can absolutely immobilize people. So now we're dealing with a multi-leveled problem. I've got a problem, I've done something that's got me into this, and now I don't know how to get out of it. No one wants to help me. I'm all alone, and now fear starts crushing every desire or even will to break free. And now you've got head games going on. Because if you've got fear, you've got games. You've got lies. Because the enemy has now moved you into his category. We either operate out of faith or we operate out of fear. Faith is the economy of God. Fear is the economy of the enemy. And if we camp in fear, guess what's going to happen? The language of the enemy and lies are going to start rising up. That you're worthless you're not worth saving. That's why no one wants to help you. And then we start to believe the lies. And then we further debilitate ourselves. Is this worth hearing this morning at all? So we can just sit there, or as we sung about last week, a move. There's a move. There's a move that God is making, and there's a move that we can make. I mean, God can do all He wants in our lives. He can even uh, uh, refer to uh, the Apostle Paul, in his endeavor to kill Christians. And God can knock him off of his, his donkey and onto the ground. But if Paul never participates and receives the counsel, he's not the great missionary of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's just one more person that's been knocked to the ground, 
struck with blindness and doesn't move forward. So what do we do in these realities? Um, we've got head games. We've got fear. We've got the actions in our own lives that have caused all of this. So now what? What are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this stuck position? So this morning I want to introduce you to three people in Scripture that were stuck. The first one we'll find in Acts chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to know that you're not the only person that has ever gotten stuck or will ever get stuck. The reality is that people get stuck all of the time and we find them in their circumstances in the Bible and we want to note them and note how they got out of their stuck situation. Acts chapter 3, we meet a man who has been lame for four, over 40 years of his life. Acts chapter 3, it says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who, who entered the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go up to the temple asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John and Peter, he said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple of God, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew that it was he who sat begging with alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, we have someone that is caught by surprise. They have settled in their life that they are stuck. Their only lot in life is to beg for money and be soothed at a superficial level, never thinking that there's anything more in life. And I think that there's moments in our life Forty years, this person has depended on someone carried him to the temple gate, setting him there, and they said to him, here's your job all day long, beg. Beg for money, beg for food, beg for your life, because that's all you'll ever be, that's all you'll ever have, is the sustenance that other people give you at this gate. And that can be a lot of people stuck for 40 years of their lives. You know, Chaplain Stout and I hear that at the jail all the time. We hear, you know, people say, uh, well, this is how it is. I'm uneducated. I don't have a life. Uh, I've been incarcerated too many times. I'm going to get incarcerated again. It's just a reality. I'm going to keep doing this life over. You've heard the term three, three hots in a cot. They've got food in their tummy. They've got a place to lay at night. And it's become a lifestyle. And the reality is that people can work all sorts of ideas to say we've got to help these people. We've got to stop this re-arrest. We've got to stop the system of, of doing this over and over again. But it really does come down to a person having a moment with God where someone comes up to you and says, I've got no more programs for you. Silver and gold and programs I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now there's a moment there where you're hearing something. You're being asked to do something you've never done before in your life. I've never done that before. I don't know how to walk. You're telling me to walk. I don't know how to walk. There's a lot of fears. There's a lot of game playing that can happen in an individual's head at this moment. 
and you either keep your hands to yourself and say, I was expecting silver and gold. I was expecting you to give me a program. I was expecting you to give me a handout. And you can remain angry. Or you can put your hand in the hand of the man who has faith that has just told you that in the name of Jesus that you can do something that you've never done before. And then you put your hand in his hand and in a moment... Your ankle bones become strong. Your feet bones that never worked before in their lives now are strong. And he does the first thing that I think anybody would do healed in that moment. He leaps. He not only walks, he leaps. I love the reality of what, what happens next. I can walk. I can leap. I'm strong. I was just weak a moment ago. This I could not do and now I can. And then his next breath is, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm not in the circumstances that have held me for 40 years. Now I can rise and walk. I can participate. I can be a part of life. When the expectation was, tomorrow is going to be the same as today. I'll come sit at this miserable place and beg and beg and beg for someone to finally give me enough money so I can just barely squeak by. I wonder if anybody in here is stuck like that. Most of your life has just been a misery, one after another, after another, after another, one disappointment after another disappointment, and you've just come to realize, I'm just a beggar. I'll always receive handouts. Or is God using an instrument of faith in this room to say, you don't have to stay there any longer what about people in this room who in their mind someone did something to you you replay it over and over and over and over and over you're stuck unforgiveness bitterness betrayal becomes a lifestyle of thought pattern and all you can do is try to beg someone to just soothe you Maybe it's drugs, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's just something to soothe you until you can make it through the end of the day. So tomorrow you wake up and you're stuck again and you soothe yourself and soothe yourself and God's saying, that's not the answer. Rise up and walk. Don't remain stuck in your situation. Don't remain on the world system to somehow give you one more handout. Put your hand in the hand of the man who proclaims the word of the Lord. Rise up and walk. Now what about this next individual? He's found in Luke chapter 5. He has been lame or could not walk for an undetermined amount of time according to the scriptures. We have no, long, uh, no time period given us in Luke 5 or the context around this individual. But we do know that the person is stuck. Now this person's approach is a bit different to his reality. Uh, and I, I want you to pay attention to this man's um, situation and what he does to free himself. Luke chapter 5, in, starting in verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there was a Pharisee and teacher of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Come on, that's good. That's a good line in Scripture. Jesus is in the room. The leaders of the law, leaders of the town, they're all in the room. And it says clearly, deliberately, the power of God was present in the room. Now, I don't know if I have to preach this in a Pentecostal room or not, but I've got to tell you, there's moments when you're just having church. You're going through it. I know, I've been, I've been raised in church. I know there's moments where it was just, eh, it was church. And then there's other moments where the presence of God filled the room. It's undeniable. God is here. And if you sit in your seat at that moment, shame on you. God is present to heal. You respond. You come to the altar. Miracles, signs, and wonders. I've seen it my whole life. I know that there are moments in church. God is here. And there's, there's reactions. Some people say the hair on their neck stands up. They get, oh, the presence of God. They get goosebumps all over their body. 
um, the presence of God in, in a moment like that. The, the signs are clear, evident. Uh, as I've noted, uh, there's a lot of argument of, as to when the Holy Spirit is present. But for me, it's tears and snot. Like those are, God is moving. The snot is pouring. The tears are coming down. He's healing at an inward level, and it rises to the outward level. And all of a sudden, we all know God is here. God is doing something in our midst. So Luke is making this clear demonstration. Make no doubt about it. The presence of God is here to heal. Verse 18, then behold, a man brought on a bed, a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the man, Your sins are forgiven you, or say, Rise up and walk? Do we know that phrase already this morning? Which, which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose before them, took up what he'd been laying on, and departed unto his own house. Guess what? Glorifying God. These stories are eerily similar in result, aren't they? Immediately he rose up before them, took his bed, a glorified God. And when they were all amazed and glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Now, this man is not surprised by his healing. This man wakes up one morning and he says, the word is out. Jesus is in town and the power of God is available to heal. I don't know if he used Morris code, a cell phone, uh, email, I don't know how he contacted his friends, but he says, guys, come and get me and get me to Jesus. I love this. And they, they, they are, they're sacked with a problem. They try to get to Jesus, but the crowd is too much. And I just want to take a little caveat here that there are times up at this altar, and I've seen it with my own eyes, where I'm ministering to people and praying with people, and there are people waiting but they get tired of waiting and they leave. Don't do that. Don't do that because getting unstuck and staying stuck is you in line. What are you going to do? What moment, what, what thing will you do to say, I've got to get to Jesus? I'm not going to let the crowd hinder me. I'm not going to let the situation hinder me. I've got to get to Jesus. This is far different than the first person who's used to handouts. This person is not used to handouts. This person is saying, I want healed. I've been this way for a long time. I don't want to stay this way any longer. I've got to get to the one who can heal me. I don't know who brought the idea up, him or his friends, but somebody has this great idea. Why don't we drop you through the ceiling? I love the creativity. I love the idea to say, look, if it's too thick around here, let's drop in from above. He certainly won't be able to ignore us then. Right? And I don't know, there's something Pentecostal and freaky and weird and strange about it. Right? So if we're going to be Pentecostals, we may as well be it. Right? Get strange, get weird. Uh, hey, I got a problem. Hey, hey, me, don't, don't leave me out. Don't leave me out, Lord. The crowd, the crowd, the popular crowd, they've got you surrounded, but I need you. How can I get an audience with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So as the ceiling tiles begin to pop off, the body begins to lower, and Jesus already has a message. He already has a message of faith for the ones that are dropping him. Look at your faith. Look at this amazing faith. I've not seen this before. This is absolutely amazing faith. I say to you, your sins are forgiven you. 
Now, to a lot of people, that might be a letdown. But isn't God offering the greatest miracle first? I see that you're in a condition of sin because God has the ability to look through your physicality right to your heart and say, I know what's going on here. You think it's physical, but it's truly spiritual, and you're in need of a Savior, and I'm the Savior. I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven you. But he could hear the moans and the groans in the crowd. Oh, who is this guy? Who does he think he is, playing God? So then he has a conversation with the crowd. It's really not about him at this moment. It's about disbelief that has filled the room that Jesus Christ is actually Lord, Savior, God. So he settles that argument very quickly. Uh, if I can say forgive sins or rise up and walk, which would be easier. So I'm just going to show you that I'm God. Rise up and walk. Again, I think the expectation from, for the man coming, I want to walk. And so when the offer is given him, I think he makes no waste of time. I will certainly get up. I will certainly brush myself off from this life of beggarly living. And I will now stand to my feet. And as he does, he rejoices. Again, he leaps. And again, we see, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Two different types of people. One was stuck because of social circumstances, the social parameters. This is where you sit. This is where you beg. This is where your life is. And he goes beyond that because someone has faith for him. Rise up and walk. The next man says, no, 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 I'm waking up. I know Jesus is in the room. And I know that he can heal me. And he too walks. The next person I want to introduce you to is found in Luke chapter 13. It's a woman. She's been bent over for 18 years. She's an interesting study, this woman. Uh, she is in this position, the, the scriptures tell us, that she is bent over by a spirit of infirmity. There are a lot of things that medical doctors can x-ray and say, oh, here it is. You clearly have this uh, problem down here in your lower back. I can see the problem, and we're, we're going to have to operate here, or you're going to need to see a chiropractor. I mean, there's some diagnosis, right? You go to the doctor, and when you have a true physical ailment, they can identify it and begin to fix it. Are you with me? This woman has a spirit. Now, I don't know if you can get there with me. A demonic oppression that has caused her physicality to respond and she's bent over like this. Now I'm not saying that everybody that walks bent over has a demonic spirit, but this person does. They have an affliction on them that is caused by a spirit of infirmity. Very interesting to note that this person's physical problem stems from an oppression. So we're going to read into it and learn how this person becomes unstuck from their circumstances. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse number 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no way raise herself up. I love that this is written, first of all, by Luke, who by trade is a, a doctor. He is a physician, so he knows what he's talking about. I wonder if he had dialogue with her before the service started. Hey, what's going on there? You're bent over. Have you ever tried anything? Have you ever tried to stand up? Oh, I've tried everything. I can't get out of my circumstance. I'm stuck. I can't move. I do this, I tried that, I've done on this over here. I cannot get unstuck from my position. In no way could she raise herself up. She's literally stuck in a situation. Uh, verse 12, but when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. So let's back up. 
This is a woman who seems to me to be a regular synagogue attending individual. She's there, she comes week in or week out. And some of you need to hear this. Regardless of her pain and regardless of her circumstances, she comes weekly to worship the Almighty. Isn't that good? So no matter what, I don't care if I'm bent over, I'm going to synagogue. I'm going to church. I'm going to church. Regardless of my ailment. I mean, some of us, I mean, it's starting to sprinkle outside and we turn on the news. Oh, it's rain. Forget it. Not going. Some of us know the day before, oh, my knees. It's going to, oh, oh, God, it's going to rain tomorrow. God, all my plans are done. Forget it. I mean, we've got all of these excuses wrapped up. Not this woman. 18 years, she's been coming to synagogue. But this week, there's a guest speaker. I don't even think she knows there's a guest speaker. Nobody told her. She didn't get a bulletin last week. There's some problem in communication. It wasn't on the PowerPoint. She didn't know that Jesus was going to be there. Jesus begins to speak. He notices the bent over woman. I I don't know if he stopped his preaching, but I I, I love church in the Bible. It just seems to have no, like we're preaching now, wait till the altar. No, 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 none of that. Like right in the middle of Jesus speaking, he can notice something and say, stop, you, come here. Now note, Jesus is an able-bodied, 30-something young man in the synagogue preaching. Of the individuals that need to move, which one do you think should do the moving? Shouldn't it be Jesus? Shouldn't Jesus, an able-bodied young man, God himself in the flesh, No physical problem, no ailment whatsoever. Shouldn't he be walking up to the old lady and saying, now, now, I see you're hurting. Shouldn't he move to her? But he doesn't. Jesus does this amazing thing. He says, ma'am, you, for 18 years, stuck in your circumstances, come here. You come here. Now, I don't know how long it took. You know, my dear mother, she's, She's got um, uh, memory issues, Alzheimer's, all of that. It takes her a long time to get from the parking lot to to the church. We've since got her a wheelchair because it goes a lot faster now. (laughs) (laughs) But my dear mother, she walks like this speed. Like, come on, Mom. Come on. Do you you got a fast in you? Do you got a fast? And she used to, but not anymore. And I've just got to imagine in this setting... I don't know how far she was from Jesus. I don't know the proximity, but I do know the speed of injury. The speed of injury slows everything down. And it seems to us like, oh, man, this lady, Jesus, just just go to her. But he waits because I I think there's something about getting unstuck that makes you make the first move. Jesus beckons you, what are you going to do? Oh, God, my back. God, you know my back hurts. I can't. It'll take all day for me to get to you. I mean, whatever the excuses are, right? But there's something about the invite. And I'm not saying that I'm Jesus or any other pastor or evangelist or preacher that stands up here as Jesus. But if they invite you, I don't care what your level of infirmity is, you move. You move. Because I'm not Jesus. The altar is where Jesus meets you. It, it, it's something about the move from where you are to, to the spot where he's going to heal you. And he does something beyond that. He calls her to himself. And then look what he says to her. Um, he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight. And guess what she did? glorified God. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and he made me whole. There's something in the command You're loosed. And the touch 
and the release. You've been in the presence of Jesus. Something has transformed in your life and you were stuck for 18 years and now your testimony is, I was stuck, but now I'm not. I was this way and now I'm not that way. I have been released from the bondage. Now think of it. In a moment, in a command, I, 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 believe, I believe because of the theology, she was bound by a spirit. And I think when he says to the woman, you are loosed, he's not talking to the woman, he's talking to the spirit, get out of here. Leave her alone. She's a child of God. Leave her alone. Release her. And then he touches her and she's immediately standing up. I think, all right, God. I, I, I don't know who's in the sound of my ear this morning, but I wonder if there's anyone who they cannot point to the DNA. They cannot point to some um, doctor analysis. All they know is they're stuck. There's no excuse for it. There's no reason for it. And I'm just offering it up. Maybe there's a spirit of iniquity holding you down. And there's only one with the power to release you. It is the power of Almighty God that says, Woman, son, you're loosed from your infirmity. And every demon in hell has to listen. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There is no demonic power that can override the authoritative word of God. That's why we try to get you to memorize it for yourself. Because when you speak the memory verses of the word of God, those demons have to listen to you as well. Are, are, you, are you grasping the concept? Released. Every person that I brought to you this morning had to be intentional. They, they had to do something in their intentionality. The first individual in Acts chapter 3, what was his intention? What, what did he intentionally have to do to respond to God? And his was quite easy. Put his hand into Peter's. Put his hand into Peter's. And some of you have been stuck for a long time, and all God's trying to get you to do is be accountable with some other believers. You've been trying to do it all by yourself your whole life and you come up with new ideas, new ideas and they never work and God's just saying, just put your hand with someone else that knows. Do devotions with someone else that knows. Get with people that know how to pray and put your hand in theirs and learn a little something about breaking free. If you can hear that message today that maybe you think you can do it as a lone ranger and God's saying, you can't. You just need somebody that can say, get up. Get up and do this. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. There are other individuals that know. They know. They know the power of God. They know the, avail the availability of God. They know what it takes to surround themselves with godly people. They have friends that are godly and they're even willing to rip off ceiling tile for you to get to Jesus. The only problem is that sometimes we can get embarrassed around friends like that. They just seem to be too much. They're over the top. They're too Pentecostal for me, God. I can't be friends with people like this. I get in church with them and they're like this. I get elbowed. I, I just, God, I, Why? And God's just saying, look, sometimes it just takes a little person in your life that's extra that can bring you to the point where they're willing to rip off ceiling tiles to get you close to Jesus. You need friends like that. Be intentional. Wake up and say, I need friends like this. I need people like this in my life that will push me to the feet of Jesus. This last lady, this intentional person that meets Jesus accidentally, in her pain, in her sorrow, in her injury, she's got to make a move. I mean, can you imagine the song service just ended? They've been on their feet for an hour. And then they get to sit down. You, get up. <laughs> I'm stuck. The intentionality is to move even in your apparent infirmity. Be intentional to move to Jesus. 
because your old story doesn't have to keep being your old story. Behold, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are brand new. What are, what are we doing here today? I mean, everybody's got their story. Everybody's got their thing. I'm stuck. On, I'm addicted to this. I'm addicted to that. You can keep that your story. Or you can say, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something. That enigmatic something. I don't know what it is, but God did something. And now I know. He touched me. I know some of your, your stories in this room. I know some of you are overburdened. Some of you send your text to me. Hey, pray for me. I'm going through this. Pray for me. I'm going through that. Look, I appreciate that. And I know that there are people suffering in this room right now through various things. And I'm here to tell you, no matter what it looks like, no matter what the scenario is, I think we've enfolded enough here today to say, he's here and he's available. He can minister to you in spite of what the circumstances are. He can release you from whatever bondage you find yourself in. So I want to invite you to stand with me. And I, I hope you're expecting this, that if you are stuck, in any rhyme or reason or circumstance of life, I want to open this altar again. I want to invite you to come finally, once and for all, to be released from your circumstances. Whatever they look like, sound like, whatever your current testimony is, God is present to heal, deliver, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. So as the worship team begins to play, I want to invite my altar workers again to come. And I just want us to believe together in prayer that this is a day of freedom. That this, this November 13th, you can mark in your, your calendar, he touched me. And my life is never going to be the same again. Heavenly Father, we glorify you. We thank you for your divine presence delivering, setting us free, opening our eyes to our own situations, that you are Lord over all. You are worthy that we would come to you asking to be released. And I pray, Father, that today would indeed be a day of celebration. We are set free from the past, set free from our bondage, truly released unstuck from our situations to give you the praise the glory the adoration that our lives would glorify you from here on out let nothing disturb that reality let nothing steal that victory that we would walk in it daily that we are transformed by Jesus and I pray Father that as we do it will be repeated over and over in our lives and to others the testimony of grace the ministry of your spirit onward moving beyond the walls of the church and father that there would be victory after victory because of the work that you are doing in the life of your church and father we ask this accomplished in jesus name amen